imagine you're looking at the Earth from outer space. And the economy and human settlements are obviously a subset of what's going on on the planet. And so the economy is a subset of the larger ecological life support system. The, the conventional view is largely the economy is the system and the environment is the subsystem. Well, that, from a physical point of view, doesn't make sense. We have to recognize that we live on this finite planet and the economy is a subsystem. Everything is connected, and so everything has a value, and that's what ecological economics tries to do, really. It's trying to put value on all of these things within a system, whether it's the value of the crop or the value of the water or the value of the soil. Emerging Science is a Vermont Public Television production in partnership with and funded by Vermont NSF EPSCOR. EPSCOR, supporting science and engineering in Vermont colleges and businesses and encouraging young Vermonters to seek careers in science. Hi, I'm Amy Seidel and welcome to Emerging Science. This week our topic is ecological economics. The words economy and ecology share the same root, oikos, the Greek word for household. While economics means the management of the household, ecology translates as the study of the household. As Farley, Erickson and Daly explain, one way to understand ecological economics is to consider one's own household. Management of a household requires setting budgets and priorities, qualities that keep a house healthy and functioning for an indefinite future. Food, water, and energy are some of the inputs that flow through a house. How households dispose of their waste outputs, like sewage and garbage, are critical to the health of a home. Using this model, we can scale up ecological economic concepts to larger social systems, such as towns, cities, and entire countries. Just as a household needs roofs and plumbing, societies need highways, access to energy, and water treatment. They also require regulation around the flow of natural resources so that clean air and water are maintained. Increasingly, we find that human activities are significantly affecting our life support systems, ecosystems which in the past diluted our waste and replenished our sources of food and water are now threatened with collapse. Jared Diamond in his recent book looked back historically at the different civilizations that have either collapsed or had been sustainable over time and what were the factors that contributed to that. Things like loss of ecosystem services and biodiversity and water supply. Those prior examples were all relatively small scale. Where we are now is we're all so interconnected that it's one big global civilization. And if there's a, a collapse of that civilization, it's going to affect the entire planet rather than just the, the local region. The classic definition of economics is the allocation of scarce resources toward alternative desirable ends. Where are markets appropriate and where are markets not appropriate? And I think this recent financial collapse that the United States was at the helm of really has brought those kinds of questions back into vogue. Where are free markets, unregulated markets, the appropriate tool to encourage economic growth? Where do markets need to be regulated? And where are markets just not appropriate? That's the chief way to allocate scarce resources. Mainstream economics took a path throughout the 20th century of carefully defining mathematical models that would guarantee the result that free markets are the best way to allocate resources. We've got to step back and say, yes, the market's a good servant, but it's a poor master. Let's decide on our goals first, use the market more appropriately uh, to help us to help us get there. The profit motive certainly motivates most of the corporate entities in our current system, but I would argue that that's a uh, incomplete set of signals because the profits that people in the corporate sector see exclude all of those external effects. So their, their real costs and their real benefits are not apparent to them. So one thing that we could do is to make the market tell the truth, you know, a little bit, or at least a closer approximation to the truth by incorporating the real costs and the, and, the, uh, and the external benefits as well. Ecological economics really, again, answers that same question, how do we allocate scarce resources to meet alternative desirable ends, but looks at the scarce resources first and foremost and really questions what our ends are. 
Our world is comprised of varying political and social opinions. For instance, if you ask 20 friends for their opinion on a financial, environmental, or community matter, and what they feel the desirable end should be, you may get 20 different answers. In classical economics, we've been limited to just one measure of desirable ends, gross domestic product. GDP, gross domestic product, or gross national product. The discussion got started back in the 30s, in the sort of post-Depression era, but it really took off in post-World War II period. They had a meeting at Brenton Woods, New Hampshire, in 1948, I think it was, where it was decided to create the World Bank and the IMF and the other global institutions, and also that GDP, or GNP, at the time was the appropriate measure for economic activity. During the war, it and input-output analysis was used to sort of help decide how we could produce enough stuff for the war, the weapons for the war. So how do we rearrange our economy and how can we sort of, you know, get that production going? So it's really very production oriented. Well, I think most economists would agree that, that it's not a good indicator of, of welfare. It was never designed as an indicator of welfare. Um, but there's a lot of inertia in the system. The problem with GDP is everything, when, when you use GDP as a measure of our welfare, everything is counted as a benefit. You have a flood, you need to rebuild your city, that's a benefit. You have a disease epidemic, you need to spend more on health care, that's a benefit. You have a high divorce rate, two households are always better than one in terms of GDP. An oil spill, you've got to spend the money to clean up. GDP also doesn't count many things. It doesn't count the value of household labor, the value of volunteer work. Gross domestic product, which is primarily a measure of the output of goods and services for a nation, is now being questioned as the best measure of a nation's overall health. Research indicates that happiness in the United States increased through the 1950s and 60s, then dropped off as we entered the 80s and 90s. While our GDP has grown, as a society, we've become less and less happy. It appears we need a different measure to judge how well our national household is doing. Several people have tried to go beyond GDP. What's a better measure of welfare? One possibility is something called the Genuine Progress Indicator, which <laughs> includes uh, adjustments for the distribution of income. It includes adjustments for the loss of natural capital, for the loss of various aspects of social capital. The cost of crime you know, are subtracted rather than added into this indicator. And it shows very different results than GDP. In the U.S., GDP has been increasing since the post-world period with some ups and downs, but GPI has been stagnant since about 1975. We want to have an economy that takes into account everything that contributes to human well-being and its sustainability, and recognizing that there's many things that play that role that are outside the market. Things like natural and social capital and, and the services that they provide, which we estimate make up more than half of the contribution to well-being uh, around the world, but are off the books as far as the conventional economic thinking is concerned. Obviously, that means it has to be a more transdisciplinary approach. We really try to let the problem define the methods, define the disciplines that are required to solve it. As energy is becoming more and more expensive, the ability to both source energy and materials from around the world and externalize the cost of their consumption and production around the world is becoming more and more difficult. And so whether by design or by default, we're seeing kind of a relocalization of economy and, and therefore rethinking the sources and sinks of our energy to fuel those economies. When economists use the term externalized costs, they typically mean the set of negative impacts associated with a particular economic transaction. Consider the complex issue of energy in which the externalized costs are significant. There are, for instance, externalized environmental costs associated with extraction and combustion, geopolitical costs in the wars we fight to secure fuel supplies, and social and economic costs as we entertain building a renewable energy infrastructure. At the University of Vermont, a new research group has formed to explore the emerging science of biofuels. The most valuable aspect of this group is the diversity of its members and the interdisciplinary breadth of the study itself. Well, the biofuels group is a mixture of chemists, soil scientists, agronomists, ecologists, and economists, all looking comprehensively at the question of how can we do small-scale biofuels production mixed in with dairy agriculture in the state of Vermont. 
So we're looking at biofuels in, in relationship to the sort of agricultural roots of the Vermont economy. Uh, we're also looking at biofuels because some of the strategies that have been subsidized at a national level um, might not make a whole lot of sense for the, for the nation, but it might not make a whole lot of sense for Vermont. So, for example, corn-based ethanol. Corn-based ethanol has, has very poor energy return and energy investment, meaning you put a unit of energy in, how much energy do you get out? And for corn-based ethanol, it looks to be anywhere between one and two versus the average for fossil fuels around the world right now is 20. So are we going to be able to substitute the amount of work that we get from one energy in, 20 out, that we have in fossil fuels now with one energy in, 1.2 out? <laughs> That's going to be difficult to do. My name is Heather Darby and I'm the agronomist for the University of Vermont Extension. I grew up here in Vermont on a dairy farm. About five years ago purchased my family's farm in Alberg, Vermont and I operate that with my husband Ron and so seven generations here in Vermont. Farmers were starting to see increasing fuel costs. People were really interested in what some of the alternatives were. Most of the energy usage on a farm is in the form of diesel fuel. And there's no fancy technology really that we had to come up with. And farmers started to ask, well, can we produce our own oil and make diesel fuel? And that's how the project got started. So I guess some people would call it the low hanging fruit. This particular site is a private farm, Borderview Farm in Alberg, Vermont, owned by Roger and Claire Rainville. Roger Rainville is really interested in research, so he's worked with us to build his private farm into really a premier research facility. We have about 700 plots focused on oilseed agronomics, which essentially studies how best to grow these crops in the state of Vermont. So what we have to do is replicate these treatments so we have treatments throughout the field. The primary end measurement for all of these oilseed trials are yield and oil quantity and quality. We started growing primarily sunflowers, canola, and soybeans, and we found that we were getting yields very similar to what folks were getting out west, and that was very positive for us. So part of this project is really fitting oil seed production and biofuel production, integrating it in, into livestock systems. Vermont has commonly been a dairy state. You know, the major brunt of income that comes into the state that's agriculturally based. 